please have a pen and paper handy. There are some things you may want to remember. I'm so grateful for all of you who are giving your time and energy to join me this evening or whatever the clock says in your time zone or country for that matter, because we have people from all over the world. So thank you, thank you very much and welcome to my home where I also work. My intention, especially during these strange times, is for you to come away with some insights that will add value to your life and to your relationships. And we are grateful for your donations. We rely on the generosity of attendees, so anything you can give is greatly appreciated, and it really goes a long way. I'm here tonight to share some about neuroscience, how it relates to love, and what the presentation is about is much more. The latest in brain science says we're not hardwired to be a certain way for the rest of our life, and we're not destined to be at the mercy of our genes. Rather, we are marvels of adaptability and change. I'll be sharing about epigenetics, a relatively new science about how our environment affects our gene expression. Is there anything practical about love? Some say love is a practice. What's a love practice? Giving back, open communication. But what is open communication to one person might not be open to another. For instance, can you think of people you know, couples or otherwise, who think they're open, but at times generate a lot of conflict? The conversation about what's practical and mystical could go on for hours. So everyone's invited to stay after we finish, where we can share our thoughts and feelings till the wee hours if we want. Okay, what's mystical? Well, I got struck by lightning at the moment of my father's death when I was 19. It was jolting, but I was on a wood floor, so I'm still here. I'd say that was a mystical moment, and I think it was about love. Why? After the lightning struck, I started to look within as I had been involved in some risky behavior. That began a sort of inward journey. My dad was basically an absentee father, so maybe the lightning was his expression of love doesn't get any more tough love than that. Then in another relationship, there were, uh, the, I mean, so in, in another kind of relationship, there were moments with an old girlfriend when what seemed like an hour was four hours later. I'll leave that to your imagination. For some people, there's something mystical when they fall in love. One of the things I wanna to present tonight is how to cultivate and sustain love with anyone in your life, love that flourishes and thrives. By the way, I never wanna fall in love. What comes up for you when you hear me say that? Would you please put a response in the chat if you dare to venture a guess? I never wanna fall in love. Okay, what happens when you fall? There's usually pain, right? So I want to rise in love. How does language create a mindset? I wanna rise in love, but so much of what we see in here is I wanna fall in love. I for one have had enough pain with love, which has mostly been about unmet needs that go back to my childhood. In other words, there was some trauma. For me, it was the absence of secure attachment. In our neuroscience of trauma webinar that we give every month, especially for teachers, we explain how to build resilience in the face of trauma and details are on our Eventbrite page. Some of us have been really upset by disappointment in romance, in business, in breakups, betrayals and broken hearts, but Here's some good news, and you may want to write this down. Hearts don't break, minds break. Again, it is our intention tonight to offer some food for thought for friends, families, couples, singles, and anyone in between, and to provide some clarity, perhaps especially for people 
who, when you ask them if they're in a relationship, they say, don't ask. Has anyone ever heard that? Has anyone ever said that? Again, this evening is not just for people in a partner relationship. It's dedicated to exploring a feeling so strong it can change the world. Relationships can be stressful, right? Well, the response humans have to daily stress is similar to the stress response when we were running from a saber-toothed tiger, except our daily stress is not life-threatening. But the chemicals that get released are the same that came about, that still come about when there's really extreme danger. Tonight, our desire is to offer some information as to how we can cultivate love and connection with anyone and keep the stress level down. Valentine's Day, needless to say, is about love. But as the webinar description said, along with the winter holiday, it is a time when there are the most breakups. For any couples or would-be couples, let's get beyond the stress this holiday brings up and let's see if Valentine's Day can be an opportunity to celebrate potential. You saw the opening with a flock of birds. They were flying in formation. There was no leader. So how do they stay together? Everyone leads. Everything and everything that happens, for instance, when someone falls and trips, or trips and falls, the flock of humans move to help out. Like the birds and the schools of fish, there's no leader. As a flock of humans connected to some unseen, unknown force, consider our potential for care, compassion, and kindness, especially in relationships. Rumor has it that Valentine's Day was a fertility festival for a Roman god. Later, the church, thank you very much, co-opted the day to commemorate a saint. As one Valentine's story goes, a priest by that name in pre-Christian Rome married soldiers in secret after the king banned marriage, hoping single life would make his soldiers more robust, hardy, and fearsome. Well, there are numerous other stories, but either way, Valentine's has made a fortune for the chocolate industry. Let's all have a look at this funny, really not so funny caption. There's a lot of jokes about love and some of them are biting. Often in comedy, they are. But unlike this message, we're going to take the high road tonight. No cynicism, no put downs, no degrading anyone. I have not had an easy time with love and companionship. No one is to blame. Though I only had a child's limited analytical abilities, subconsciously, I knew I did not want to replicate my parents' relationship. But where was I to find role models that inspired me? I love Lucy, leave it to Beaver, father knows best. For those of us who were there then, does anyone remember Ward or June showing any emotion? Sure, they were a very nice white couple, but did it equip boomers with a model of a relationship we wanted to replicate? And what about the children of the boomers? And on and on. A key element of my coaching work is a simple question to ask when conflict arises. When there's an issue, we say to stop and simply ask, what liberates the most love? For those of you who are in a relationship, want to be in one, relationships with family, neighbors, friends, relatives, Write this one down. What liberates the most love? Great question to ask, especially when conflict starts to arrive. And it's also really the underlying intent, intent of this evening. Now, a few words from Cicely, our co-director, who, by the way, just finished redesigning our new website. 
Okay, awesome. Thank you, Michael. Uh, yeah, we just we did just want to tell everybody a little bit about what we do, kind of just so you know, understand where we're coming from, where we're coming from, where Michael's coming from. We um, actually started um, providing group workshops and curriculum to school, uh, especially in the New York City area. But now we work with schools anywhere, workshops for corporations of all sizes, different social service organizations, fellow nonprofits, and really pretty much any group that's you know, interested in healthy relationships and whatever their circle is. Um, so that's where we come from. And so um, just so everybody kind of knows a little bit about where we work, where you can see us, we have a Patreon for people who, you know, want to support our work. We try to give away as many monthly freebies as we can. And also it lets people who really like our webinar series join without having to register for every webinar. So that's one of the benefits. And then we also offer discounts on our other workshops and trainings and our curriculum, so you can see that. We also have a private Facebook group. So for other kind of like-minded folks, it's a nice place to be able to connect. And then also on that uh, screen, you can see we have um, our book. We actually have it on our website. You can download it on a by donation basis. So we have a suggested amount that helps us cover our costs, but you can give whatever you're able to. But highly recommend the book. It's a very easy read, but you'll learn a lot, a lot of like what you're hearing here tonight and more. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll tell you some more about what some of our upcoming webinars are, as well as our two upcoming full length trainings, one of which starts tomorrow. Um, so maybe by the end of tonight, you'll decide you want to jump in on that. There is still time to sign up. And then the other one is in March if you need some more time to plan. So make sure you stick around to hear about that. And then also Michael mentioned his coaching services. So that's something else he'll tell you more about kind of throughout the webinar. It's great for single folks, couples, and really anybody who's wanting to improve their relationship skills. And uh, we do have a survey so you can give us some feedback or if you want more information so we can have your email. So you can, um, we'll try to put it in the chat now just in case anyone has to leave early. Um, but then again, of course, we hope you won't. <laughs> and so we'll put it in at the end as well. Um, so that's it. So I'll turn it back to Michael. Okay. Thank you, Cicely. We've been introducing relationship dynamics in New York City schools for the last 12 years. We ask students to keep journals on how they perceive relationships personally and in society. Imagine if we had relationship education growing up. Well, I'd like to share a journal entry that was written by a 16 year old student who was in a healthy relationships class we taught in a school in Queens a few years ago. He wrote, what honestly is love? Is it an emotion, feeling, or an action? I feel that as humans, our, our biggest necessity is companionship and to be loved and give love. We are strange affectionate creatures always trying to express emotions for one another in a variety of ways. I believe our affectionate emotions spawn from the greatest thing humans have, understanding. We want to understand others and be understood. Given the opportunity, young adults have a lot to share with us. So before each chapter in our book, which is downloadable, as Cicely said, for a nominal donation, there's a student journal entry that pertains to the subject of each chapter. Would you mind putting a few words that come to mind in the chat about this student journals and this student's journal entry? This was a 16 year old male student. Okay, so in one of our earliest classes, I came upon an article in Marie Claire magazine. It was the only magazine in the office where I was waiting for a doctor's appointment. So I started to leaf through it. It was fate that a magazine that I wouldn't generally think to look at was at my, fingers tip, my, my fingertips. There was an article in it called, Is There a Cheating Gene? It was about a journalist who constantly cheated on her partners and always had someone waiting in the wings. Know anyone who has a, has a strategy like that? 
Well, anyway, then along the way, she met someone and got engaged. Just before her wedding, she was on an assignment in Italy and found herself attracted to her local assistant. She thought about having a last fling and then decided against it. Why? She had an epiphany that she was following in the footsteps of her father who had been unfaithful all throughout her childhood. And she also realized he was much more than his infidelities. He had invented a photographic process that revolutionized the industry. But he had grown up dirt poor in an orphanage. And for him, there was never enough love to make up for what he missed as a child. With that, she decided to leave the past behind. She had broken the chains of her emotional branding. We asked the students if they knew someone who didn't trust love. Everyone's hand went up. Then we asked if they didn't trust love. I put up my hand as did all 33 of the students. And thus we began the journey of exploring and understanding what a healthy relationship could be. The mission of this course was to know how to create fulfilling relationships. And this is meant to stop taking scraps of love and playing small. My dad was a workaholic and it struck me after reading what this journalist had gone through and experienced with her father, how it was for me also growing up with my father. He essentially left the family for his work life, all day, nights and weekends. However, he was much more than his workaholic behaviors. He had been a soldier in the Army Air Force and flew on dangerous missions during World War II. And reading letters I found that he wrote to grandma, he was also a devoted son. So nonetheless, I'm going to guess that with my father as a role model, it somewhat explains why I have never trusted love and why overworking comes easy. This is my dad, Benjamin. He's on the right. He was five years old in this picture. I've just referred to my father whose way of life affected my outlook on relationships. Well, what affected his life? Why did he shut himself away in his office? In this picture, he is holding his sister and my uncle Henry is to the left. Well, I grew up in Lan or my father grew up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, as did I, and he grew up on a farm. So this picture was taken in front of the barn and it caught fire. And uncle Henry did not make it out of the fire. I'm imagining that my father got a whooping and or blamed and shamed that left a scar. My father never shared this with us. So there was something about, uh, there was a gap. Uh, and I think, again, that's why he just hid away from life in his job. And uh, we really never knew much about him. And so, as, as I said, I'm, I'm replicating some of his behaviors and this is what's called a uh, generational trauma. I want to say that with all this, I dedicated my book to my father uh, and my mother, because if it wasn't for them, it might be you giving this presentation. Very simply, they did the best they could with what they learned from grandma and grandpa, who were born when the light bulb was relatively new. What did they know? It was about survival. And I think for my dad, emotionally, survival was locking himself away in his work. Now we have students practice communication skills such as learning to express their needs and feelings without blame and judgment and to listen empathically. We introduce relationship dynamics in city schools, classes, and teacher trainings. The skill set we introduce is known as nonviolent communication. There you can see the book about it. And you can also see the, uh, the um, uh, location and the email for the uh, per, uh, publisher of this book, which we highly recommend. Uh, it's been the cornerstone of our work. So we only have enough time to go into one aspect of nonviolent communication tonight, and it's called empathic listening. Tomorrow night, we're going to be giving an hour and a half workshop where we, where we will go in depth into the key elements of nonviolent communication, also known as NBC, 
and how these principles can bring new life to any relationship. Uh, Cicely, is there room for the uh, president for the webinar tomorrow? The yes, yes, okay. we do still have a, a few okay. yeah seats left in it. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, well, uh, NVC is also the cornerstone of my coaching practice. The night we're going to uh, we're going to do an empathy practice. Here's the dictionary definition. It's the ability to share and understand the feelings of another. How can you share the feelings of another if they don't tell you what they're feeling? So our work with nonviolent communication, and you can find this on our website, is a whole list of needs and feelings. So we're also gonna show you what empathy is not. It's not one-upping. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone and for instance, saying something like, hey, the traffic was really, really thick this morning. I was late for work. What do they say? Let me tell you about the traffic I was dealing with. One-upping, advising, fixing. Have you ever received unrequested advice from your parents? Educating. You know, there's a good GPS system you can get so that you, you can avoid the, the, uh, the heavy traffic. Analyzing. We say these things all the time. Hey, yet the traffic was, you know, this is, you say this every day. It's all about the traffic. Consoling. Well, you're here now, so put it behind you. Did that person ask for consoling? Judging. You know, you, you don't know how to make the right decisions on the road. Data gathering. Well, when did you leave the house? What exit did you take? What entrance did you go on? Storytelling. Somebody will start telling a story about something happened to them. Well, you know, last week this happened to me. Arguing. No way. It didn't really take you that long. Providing answers. Well, you know, the best thing to do. And on and on. Lecturing. Or ordering someone around. Prying. Preaching. All of these are empathy blocking. And we block empathy over and over while thinking we are simply making conversation or answering a call for feedback. Here's a video we just made and narrated that illustrates empathy blocking. Empathy, what it is and what it isn't. First, what it isn't. Your friend says, I had a bad night. I could hardly sleep at all. Here's what we call empathy blocking. Let me tell you how bad my night was. I only slept four hours. One upping. Maybe you should take a sleeping pill. Unrequested advice. Fixing. You know, there's a good book on diet and sleep. Educating. You say this every day. Analyzing. Well, that was last night. It's over. Consoling. At least you got some sleep. Discounting. Did I tell you I'm going on vacation next week? Changing the subject. Here is empathic listening. Your friend says, I had a bad night. I could hardly sleep at all. You simply say, I hear you. Then a moment of silence. That moment of silence is like taking a breath. Dare I say, a breath of fresh air. I hear you says, I'm present and receiving you. You can also simply say, wow, sounds like a tough one. I hear you, wow, yikes. All acknowledge that you are present. Empathy is being interested rather than interesting. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Empathy. So there it is. Again, you may want to write this one down. Empathy is being interested rather than interesting. In one of our classes, 
we had a student that blurted out when we had this discussion said, I've been being interesting my whole life. And in that moment, she changed. She saw that there could be something different. And think about our relationships, the ones that you're in now, the people you may be with tonight or anyone you get, in, get that you're involved with. Sometimes I, I've been in an elevator. I remember one time it was raining, I'm in New York City and somebody gets in the elevator and starts complaining about the traffic. And I kept saying, and he, and he went on, on to the 54th floor, on and on. And I kept saying, I hear you gently. It's like, you can hear, you can hear yourself almost. You can feel, have a sense of, of uh, uh, that uh, vibration in your chest. When you say, I hear you, you can say, wow, just wow. Or, or uh, yikes, if it's something, you know, where somebody said, oh, I just got into a, a, a fender bender. Yikes. But not the data gathering, not all the one upping, not all of the uh, 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 consoling and discounting. So um, you can download on our website uh, the uh, empathic listening exercise, right, Cicely? I think we can. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's already been uh, posted in the chat. Okay. Now, what you've all been patiently waiting for, a little of the neuroscience. Hormones. How does love and attraction affect our hormones? Hormones are chemicals in the body that respond to environmental factors. You're, you experience attraction, you experience shock. Hormones are, are released. Right now, hormones are being released. At every, every moment in our life, hormones are being activated by our environment. And they attach to receptors on our cells that affect our mood and bodily functions, depending on our environment, like attraction or upset. Certain hormones are activated when there's a feeling of love, appreciation, or desire. Different hormones are released depending on whether we're experiencing love, attraction, or attachment. Here are three well-known hormones. Oxytocin, it's, a, it's vital in forming relationships. And for this reason, it is found in romantic and attachment types of love. When oxytocin plays out in couples, they often stay together after the dopamine thrill is gone. It's a factor in long-term relationships. So those of you who are here this evening in a long-term relationship, it's the oxytocin and much more. Oxytocin helps facilitate social behaviors such as eye contact and other actions that help us to build and strengthen intimacy. When we experience attachment, oxytocin is secreted by the brain. So please look at your partner, if you're here with someone tonight, a friend, a relative, whomever you're with, and make eye contact. If you are here by yourself, imagine as best you can. Thrilling, isn't it? Eye contact. Serotonin. The hormone serotonin is associated with attraction. Scientists believe that certain serotonin, serotonin levels cause the overpowering infatuation that often characterizes the beginnings and this beginning stages of love. Please turn to your partner and notice the over overpowering attraction. Please exercise impulse control and stay with us because it's gonna get even better. Dopamine. Dopamine signals the perceived desirability of an outcome. Imaging studies show that new couples have high amounts of activity caused by dopamine in the same reward systems of the brain that fire when someone inhales cocaine. Flooded with dopamine, we are driven toward a perceived reward. Like a drug, new romance can make us obsess over what we desire and even become addicted to it. For couples, turn to your partner, if you are here with one, and say, being with you is like being on cocaine only there's no jail time. Neurons. 
Neurons are brain cells that transmit electrical signals to each other. Neurons are constantly firing and wiring. After all this reviewing of hormones, are your neurons rapidly firing? Synapse. A synapse is the gap between two neurons. It's where the electrical signals can travel from one neuron to another. This is known as firing. As we exercise our brain by learning new things and practicing the skills that we learn, we form new synaptic connections. This is known as wiring. How's your wiring going tonight? Firing and wiring. Here's a look at our neural network. Our thoughts generate a magnetic field that is broadcasting a frequency and all frequencies carry energy and the energy we create defines our present reality. These are some of the basics of neuroscience. How do our brains develop and how do relationships affect our brain? In this diagram, we see a healthy brain as compared to one that has experienced distress. Well, the distress has happened early on in life. Now we introduce a body of work called the trauma responsive approach to school staff around the country. And this diagram illustrates how trauma affects normal brain development. We'll go into this in our neuroscience of trauma webinar in the next few weeks, and we'll study it very closely in our cohort that begins tomorrow. And then we'll continue the following Friday. Brain tissue can regenerate when a person experiences love and a sense of safety and stability. And we can contribute to one another's brain health. Again, for any pairs here tonight, friends, family, couples, turn to whoever you're with and say, how would you like to go to the brain gym and build some muscles? The final piece of neuroscience for this event is epigenetics. Epigenetics is a gateway to greater intimacy. The brain takes a snapshot of every event in our life. These comprise long-term memories. If you think about a high, highly charged event, it produces the same chemical in our body as if it was occurring in the now, right now. At the same time, the brain is a record of pleasant memories. Epigenetics is how one's environment shapes and alters gene expression. The people in your life are part of your environmental landscape. First, before we go further into epigenetics, let's talk about genes. Genes are segments of our DNA. DNA is in every cell of our body. It stores genetic information. Genes are codes for traits, traits such as height, eye co color, chin shape, everything about us. Gene expressions are the specific traits we have, such as green eyes, brown eyes, five foot eight inches, black hair, brown hair, size 28, size 36. Epigenetics is the study of how our behaviors and environment affect the way our genes are expressed. Things like diet, stress, sleep, and relationships can be determining factors on how our genes express themselves. Our environment constantly influences gene expression. And if the environment engenders a positive emotion, the body begins to upregulate up genes for health and well being. And we can sustain that feeling by breaking the habit of behaviors that are not in our best interest. As we do this, our brain waves become more coherent. Then you are no longer the old self, the old program, but rather embracing a new consciousness with a greater level of awareness. It's a practice and it works and eventually you begin to know it by heart. Our work with schools and organizations practices uh, focuses on practicing respectful relationship skills and the same as with my coaching. We can activate new genes just from thought alone. This is very important, everyone. The thoughts you think are activating the genes in your body. 
the genes that are stored in your DNA. Hormones of stress downregulate gene expression and create health issues. If thoughts can make us sick, then thoughts can also make us well, especially when we stop siphoning energy from the present moment to rehash the past. For everyone, especially couples, look at your partner and say, I look forward to being a positive influence on your gene expression. And if I can't, I'll take a walk around the block and come back when I can. And finally, pruning. Here's another benefit of healthy relationships. When old behavior patterns are disrupted, the neurons that habitually fired and wired for a long time start to come apart. This is called pruning. Not like prunes, although pruning can have the same effect of getting rid of unwanted material. So did this empathy practice that you heard about allow for some pruning. Couples, friends, whoever is here with someone, turn to your partner and let them know anytime you want some pruning, just ask. With empathic listening, you can start to have a new voice in your head. You can do this by reviewing and rehearsing in your mind how you want to be how you want to receive another human being in any relationship. And this rehearsing in your mind begins to install new neurological hardware. The same with practicing. Every time you do it, it's a victory. Your life can be a victory if you see relationships as a con contribution to each other and the world. And this goes for all of us tonight. Creating a new frame of mind produces an imprint in our consciousness. Uh, I see a question uh, Cicely's put up. Uh, explain more about upregulating and downregulating. Well, genes are essentially lying dormant in our DNA, and our environment affects the expression of the genes. So when they become activated. So right now, if uh, uh, you heard a crash in, in another room, uh, uh, the hormones of stress, adrenaline and, and cortisol would start to flood through your body and, and into your brain and, and you would be scared. So that, that uh, the gene expression is activating hormones of stress. Same thing when you are uh, expressing love, feeling love, those same genes activate hormones uh, in the brain, as I mentioned, uh, hormones such as uh, uh, dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin. So upregulating and downregulating. So we tend to think of the hormones of stress as downregulating the genes, but they are operating at a similar level, only the ones that we say it up brings up the genes, the upregulating of genes that, uh, uh, that bring pleasure and, and, and love. Uh, another question is uh, about um, uh, uh, can pruning happen quickly? Well, according to uh, neuroscience, it does take some time for pruning to happen. Uh, habits that you had years ago, uh, so those may have faded over time. But we also see that can change can happen very quickly. So for anyone here tonight, and if you're with a friend, a family member, uh, 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 for couples, the pruning can start to play, take place uh, very, very quickly. Uh, so um, we'll have some more questions and we'll have dialogue when we're finished in a few minutes. But as I said, here's a reminder, empathy is being interested rather than interesting. So to be interested is to be empathic. Empathic listening is listening is simply being present and doing and in doing so these hormones of care and connection are generated the hormones that, that I've mentioned that that are activated in the brain and here you see a picture of a happy brain so the more empathic we are in all of our relationships 
the more we fill our suitcase full of oxytocin, dopamine, and serotonin. Think about how you felt when you helped someone, did community service, gave directions to someone on the street. How did you feel? How did you feel when you donated to a cause you believed in? We hope you believe in our cause and we'll be most grateful for any amount to uh, uh, help us get our work into schools and organizations. So I also wanna give thanks to teachers who have influenced us, Marshall Robert Rosenberg, the author of Nonviolent Communication, Harville Hendricks, uh, uh, considered by many the greatest relationship educator in the world, uh, was on Oprah 20 times and she declared him as one of her best guests ever, and Dr. Joe Dispenza, uh, from whom we've learned so much about neuroscience. And we'll share more about their work tomorrow in our longer trainings. So in closing, I want to say, Humans are a marvel of adaptability and change. In this relationship work, there is the potential to break free from the conditioning that doesn't serve us and then really begin to have a new life. There's a potential for all of us to develop a genius mind. This work is not just social intelligence or emotional intelligence, it's loving intelligence. Thank you for staying with us. Join us tomorrow and take a deeper dive into empathic listening and much, much more. And sign up for a, a, a free consultation on relationship coaching. I think Cicely has put uh, my relationship coaching site uh, in the chat. And thanks again. We love you. And Cicely, uh, some closing comments. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I am typing that in the chat right now my uh, chat isn't working very well <sighs> yeah for anyone who say boy i i really dig this <laughs> yeah michael's um coaching website is okay i think i typed it right there we go <laughs> it's in the chat um let's see yeah we're just we're gonna let everybody know especially for those of you who are new to our webinars on the next slide we have a list of some of our upcoming webinars that are coming up next. The next couple are kind of sort of our normal um, sort of uh, sequence of webinars. A great introduction if you're interested in learning about more about this empathy concept, or like Michael says, it's a practice. So doing it repeatedly is part of you know learning it. And then this nonviolent communication is the other aspect of what we do. So um, we do introductions to that every month. So our next one is on 23rd. And then more of the basics of trauma. That's next one is going to be on March 2nd. And then some of the others are just some of the other subject matters that we sort of have in the queue that we're still working on. Um, and then the next slide, this is where you'll see the information for those who were wondering about this uh, training that we're doing starting tomorrow night. The one tomorrow um, it starts at eight o'clock Eastern on, and the first day is the 12th and the second day is the 19th. So if you're able, so if you're interested in registering for that, we do still have a few seats left. Um, if you know um, you're really hearing things here that you enjoy, we're gonna go in in depth even more tomorrow night. And if you're a couple, you both can sign up under just the cost of the one ticket. So so if there's two of you and you both want to join in, it's not like you have to pay separate for two people. Um, but if, if tomorrow night's too soon, um, we do have another one coming up in March, March 13th and 20th. That's actually a Saturday afternoon. So we do have, have some tickets still available for that one as well. So you should be able to find that on the same Eventbrite page where you found the link to this event. And if you have any trouble finding it, go to our website, uh, trf.net, and then it'll, it'll help you find it. Uh, Sandy was asking, yes, the $90 is for the two days. So yeah, it's all, all one cost for both days. And I, I think the registration closes around noon tomorrow, just because I'll have a lot of materials to send out to anybody who signs up like tonight or tomorrow morning. So just make sure you do it as soon as you can, and then I'll have time to send you all the materials. We have a workbook and then a link to Michael's book and all that good stuff is included. So, um, and then again, for anybody who's from like organizations or if you work with the school, we do, what's a, a very similar to what's in that, that training tomorrow night, but we can do it for you know a whole school or a whole organization. Um, 
yeah oh no for the group in march that one is open for sign up all the way through the day before that one as well i think so yeah so yeah if somebody was interested in the march one you still got some time to sign up for that one yeah um so let's see all right i think we've got everybody's questions so far okay so yeah um and how we do our even our school workshops we make it where basically your school or your organization to basically donate for the workshop so it's then it's a tax deductible donation for you and you get a workshop in return so so we try to make it mutually beneficial for everybody um so that is most of that and if anybody has any questions or if i didn't have time to explain something you can um email me directly it's my first name sicily at trf.net um somebody's asking about recordings um for the cohort um, groups, um, we probably will be recording them. So yeah, if um, but it's really not quite as effective because there's several um, very interactive aspects of the cohort. So it's really best if you can come on, you know, live for the cohorts. It would still be very useful even if you couldn't. But we highly recommend people really trying to be there live. But yeah, if you if you say I know I can't make it to either of them, but you just really want to see the recordings, you can send me an email. We can we can figure out how to make that work. As far as tonight, yes, it'll be on YouTube as well, um, and I'll be sending out the replay link out to everyone that signed up. Probably tomorrow sometime, I'll be sending the link out. So if anybody missed any of this tonight, you'll be getting it tomorrow. Will there be more later in the year? Yeah, we're planning on doing these small group cohorts several times throughout the year so yeah um since you signed up with for a webinar you'll be on our newsletter list so when we get future ones going we'll be announcing um those as we as we get them scheduled so all right i think that got yeah yeah and if again if i miss anybody's question send me an email or add it in the chat again if you think i might have missed it um and then the next slide i think is just a reminder of what our website is um our book you, um, you can sign up for our newsletter although like i said since you're here tonight you'll be automatically on our newsletter now um our guidebook in our school curriculum if you're like a teacher or maybe you're a group facilitator or you work for some sort of social service organization um you can preview chapters of our guidebook and our curriculum um to see you know kind of the style and what the sort of approach it works and so that's a great way to get a taste of what that looks like so and then if you decide it works for you then you can go from there 